what I found in my early years of practice was that I needed a clear view and a clear model or system um, to help guide me, you know, that that was just kind of where I was at the time. And so when I found Daniel Ingram's writing and, and this really clear instruction manual, technical language, was all the reasoning seemed solid, um, you know, all of it sort of pointed to me in the right direction. I said, okay, this is my path. I'm going to really go for this. This is my guide. I'm going to reach out to this person, get support, go, you know, go to retreats, <clears throat> do everything I can to uh, realize the truth of this, of this, um, uh, of what what's being pointed to in in this teaching, and after a few years of doing that, I, I did find some success. You know, with that model, I found I was able to um, learn all the different concentration states, the jhanas. I learned the progress of insight, and I you know, became familiar with those patterns. I experienced cessation, you know, the dropping away of identity um, in this kind of radical moment of un, you know of uncertainty of not knowing what, what it is. Um, and had all kinds of crazy wild experiences as we all do, you know, when we're on the meditative path um, and, and going on lots of retreats um, or doing psychedelics or whatever. <clears throat> I had those experiences and, um, and that, yet, yet there was something missing in them. There was something that was lacking. And that, su that surprised me and it disappointed me really that this, whatever this thing that I was uh, striving for and that now that I had some taste of was actually not what I expected it to be. It, and, and it wasn't solving some of the problems I sort of, I guess, implicitly believed it would. It wasn't like delivering on all of my ideals. <laughs> and so um, I started to look for other ways and, and started to branch out from that approach. First, by starting to work with Jack Cornfield and Trudy Goodman, um, insight meditation teachers who also themselves had a grounding in the same tradition, the Mahasi Sayada tradition of Burma of, of, of sort of hyper, I, I call it a hyper masculine um, spiritual tradition is like noting every moment, the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed, note, 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 um, powerful stuff, you know, really. Um, and yet <clears throat> I love that they had that background <clears throat> and yet they weren't, attached to that model. They had also trained in multiple other traditions and practiced with other teachers and had this sort of very open and synthetic kind of uh, syncretic view. And, I, and something about that really was appealing to me. And when I was uh, starting to really study with them, Emily and I went, went on a long retreat at Spirit Rock. They, we did their annual two-month retreat together. This was um, 2007 or so. And we um, were on this long retreat, and um, in the second half of the retreat, Jack and Trudy and some other teachers came, and they were the kind of primary teachers. And, and during the course of this retreat, Jack really gave a, a, a wonderful talk on uh, in what he called enlightenments, plural. And this talk for me and what he shared in there really, at that time, hit home for me. It was really a kind of eye-opening. Um, it was helping me see that, in fact, there were other ways to explore enlightenment, to experience perhaps this uh, deep goal of the Buddhist path. And here in, in this article that I mentioned, Enlightenment, which is, comes directly from the talk that I heard, um, uh, Jack here described his own experience being a young monk in Thailand and in Burma, in Myanmar. And he um, had been training for a number of years with Ajahn Chah as a monk in the Thai forest tradition, um, and then went to Myanmar and did a year-long silent retreat with Mahasi Sayada in that tradition. So, you know, really hardcore, year-long. Um, and afterwards, he came back, and, and this is the beginning of the story. He said, when I returned to practice in Ajahn Chah's community, following more than a year of silent Mahasi retreat, I recounted all these experiences, dissolving my body into light, profound insights into emptiness, hours of vast stillness and freedom. Ajahn Chah understood and appreciated them from his own deep wisdom. Then he smiled and said, well, something else to let go of. His approach to enlightenment was not based on having any particular meditation experience, no matter how profound. 
As Ajahn Chah described them, meditative states are not important in themselves. Meditation is a way to quiet the mind so you can practice all day long with whatever, um, but with wherever you are. See when there's grasping or aversion, clinging and suffering, and then let it go. What's left is enlightenment, always found here and now, a release of identification with the changing conditions of the world, a resting in awareness. So here we have very different models, even within the same tradition, one, in, in two countries that are bordering each other. Okay, I mean, this is very close and yet very different. Uh, and, and even more so as you begin to explore the broader contemplative path, right? There's so many different uh, fundamental disagreements about the nature of the goal of, in the path and what it's about and how to do it. And so part of what I've really been exploring in my own practice is kind of going from one um, approach to another and really in some ways trying to exhaust the approach or really trying to understand the approach deeply and then moving on. So it's not the kind of go from one thing to the next without grokking it or go deep with one thing. I propose that that's a false dichotomy in practice, actually, that the real, the real goal uh, I would contend is to, if you want to become a deep, broad practitioner, is to go deep in multiple things and to be able to begin to interrelate them. That is much more powerful than going deep in one thing um, because you get multiple ways to work with the mind, with consciousness. And, um, and, to, and, and what came out of this exploration for myself, practicing in the Theravada tradition with multiple approaches in the Zen tradition, it's being exposed to a lot of other things is, you know, the six ways to meditate. That to me is a meta model that describes these six ways to get enlightened. You know, it's not just six ways to meditate. It's also six ways that enlightenment expresses itself. The, the enlightenment of the, of the concentrated yogi, you know, the deep samadhi. There's the enlightenment of, of mindfulness, of moment to moment awareness of what's happening, rising and passing. There is the enlightenment of the open heart, which is what we've been exploring in the series. There is the enlightenment of not knowing, of don't know mind, of inquiring and questioning and letting go. There is the enlightenment of awareness of being itself that requires nothing from us. And then there's the enlightenment of embodiment, of being inhabiting this corporeal form, of not leaving anything out. You know, all of these are ways that we as practitioners explore enlightenment and they're not all of the ways they're just it's again a limited perspective uh, only two decades of practice and study doesn't lead to a very deep understanding of the whole picture and yet this for me is is it's it's a way that i try to understand the the landscape um here again jack cornfield from from his article enlightenment he said we know that the buddha taught many different approaches to enlightenment all as skillful means to release grasping of the limited sense of self and return to the inherent purity of consciousness. Similarly, we will discover that the teachings on enlightened consciousness include many dimensions. When you actually experience consciousness free of identification with changing conditions, liberated from greed and hate, you find it multifaceted, like a mandala or a jewel a crystal with many sides. Through one facet, the enlightened heart shines as luminous clarity. Through another as perfect peace. Through another as boundless compassion. Consciousness is timeless, ever-present, completely empty, and full of all things. But when a teacher or tradition emphasizes only one of these qualities over the other, it's easy to be confused, as if true enlightenment can be tasted in only one way. Like the particle and wave nature of light, enlightened consciousness is experienced in a myriad of beautiful ways. And so um, for, for me, this brings up a real paradox. Um, and it's the paradox between what I would call unity and diversity or sameness and difference. You know, this sense that um, what we're talking about here uh, is both 
that enlightenment is just one thing. There's no um, actually multiple separate enlightenments. <laughs> um, there's a kind of convergence point in the diversity. There's a place in which all these differences come together, the essential nature of consciousness. And the moment I start to, or any of us start to kind of try to express what that is, the diversity begins to bloom. You know, the fractalization of mind happens. We start to conceptualize and, and try to make models and you know, representations of that which is not representable. And um, it's full of all things, as Jack said. There's an old Zen saying where they say, everything the same, everything different. Everything the same, everything different. For me, the, um, the loving awareness is like this as well. Heartfulness in, in the model that we use to help support practitioners is, um, you know, the six ways includes heartfulness. And if you were to zoom in on just that one way, then what I find is that it's like a self-similar fractal this awakening process. When you zoom in on one facet, then you see more facets. Um, and the open heart for me also uh, has so many different dimensions and facets. We've explored a number of them here in the last 10 weeks. We explored the traditional Brahma Viharas, you know, loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity. We also practiced and worked with gratitude and trust. And then there are other you know, dimensions or facets of heartfulness. Um, there's the practice of forgiveness, um, of patience, um, courage, awe, and wonder. All of these are different ways that we experience open-heartedness. And we can practice uh, all of these ways. We can actually do things that help really clarify the nature of compassion or generosity or equanimity. Um, and we can focus on that. We can polish one of those uh, sides of the crystal and really clearly see what it points to, uh, where, where it goes. And where does, it, where, does it, where does it go when we look into crystal? We just see the crystal itself. So when we polish one of the sides, it makes the crystal more, more apparent, the nature of it. Um, and yet we may not have access to that essence essential nature of mind when it comes to something else or another context or another situation so training and enlightenment to me is always about training and being able to be awake and present in every situation we can find ourselves um, otherwise you know what good is it